NFL draft season is quickly approaching, and because of that, I've decided to take a look back in time, specifically at last season's first round picks, the 2023 NFL draft. There were 31 first round selections, and like every year, some were great, some were okay, and some were downright terrible. You're gonna wanna stick around to watch this to see where your favorite team's pick falls. Without further ado, let's regrade the 2023 NFL draft first round, shall we? First overall pick, Bryce Young, Carolina. If you've watched my videos, it's no secret that I am not a fan of Bryce Young, and if his first 16 starts in the league are any indication, I am a thousand percent correct to not be a fan of his. He finished his rookie season starting 16 games, going 2-14, and 14, completing under 60% of his passes, not even breaking 3,000 yards, 11 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. He led the league in sack yards, just an absolutely abysmal rookie season, and he really didn't show many flashes of great potential either because he's 5'10", boosted seat Bryce is his nickname for a reason. Oh yeah, and by the way, they traded a shitload to get him, so they can't draft a guy like Caleb Williams this year because Chicago owns their pick. And oh yeah, there's another guy who was picked second overall that I'm sure Carolina wishes they had taken instead. Grade F. Second overall pick, CJ Stroud, Houston Texans. Finally, it has taken literally 90 plus years, I don't fucking know, but it's taken a long time, but Ohio State has finally produced a good NFL quarterback, and of course, Joe Burrow does not actually count. C.J. Stroud was unbelievable as a rookie. He threw for over 4,100 yards, 23 touchdowns, only five interceptions, and he led Houston to the AFC South Division. So he was putting up numbers and he was winning while doing it and just also looking like he fits the bill. He looks calm, cool, collected, under pressure. It's pretty obvious that the Texans have a stud at the most important position for the very foreseeable future. Now we just have to hope that he doesn't have the same off-field habits as Houston's last franchise quarterback. I don't think he does. Grade A+. Plus. Third overall pick, Will Anderson Jr., Houston Texans. Stroud wasn't the only top three pick the Texans had last season. And if you want to have a quick turnaround like the Texans did, you have to hit on all of your big draft picks. And they did, not just with Stroud, but Will Anderson. Anderson finished with seven sacks and was third in pass rush win rate among edge rushers, only behind established all pros Micah Parsons and Miles Garrett. He's also very good against the run. I think it's pretty safe to say that in the very short future, Anderson is going to be a first-team All-Pro and Defensive Player of the Year candidate perennially. If that ends up being the case, with both Stroud and Anderson developing into All-Pros, you can make the case that the 2023 Texans had one of the best drafts ever. Grade A+. Fourth overall pick, Anthony Big Tony Richardson, Indianapolis Colts. This was one of the most disappointing parts of the 2023 season to me, was not getting to see Big Tony and having to get stuck with Gardner Minshew for 12 games. He only played in four games and he had season-ending shoulder surgery early in October. He threw for three touchdowns and one pick and ran for 136 yards and four scores. Basically, at this point, we don't really know for certain where he ranks, but all the elite physical traits, the reason why he was selected this high to begin with, those were on display in the brief showings that we saw him on the field. So there still is plenty of reason to be excited if you are a Colts fan or a Richardson fan like I am. But objectively, right now, the sample size is still too small. So I'm going to give this a grade of incomplete, but I do believe that Richardson has the potential to be the second best quarterback in this draft class behind C.J. Stroud. And you know what? Hot take. If he reaches his full potential, he could be even better than C.J. Stroud because he truly is a freak of nature. Fifth overall pick, Devon Witherspoon, Seattle. When it comes to positions like cornerbacks and offensive linemen and things of that nature, I really do like to rely on pro football focus. I know that they've become a bit of a meme in recent years, but I think for the most part, they do a pretty good job of watching every down positions where the average casual viewer isn't really looking at, like the skill positions or the quarterback positions. And Witherspoon is a great example of this. The Seahawks had a somewhat disappointing season, but Witherspoon was not a reason why they were disappointing. He broke up 16 passes in 14 games, and he graded out at an elite 84.1 on the year. He also was a great run stopper. If he stays healthy, it's not a outlandish thing to say that he could end up with a gold jacket in Canton one day. Grade A+. plus. Sixth overall pick, Paris. Johnson Jr., Arizona Cardinals. A lot of people at the time felt like Arizona might have reached a bit for Johnson. Sounds a lot like my ex-wife. <laughs> I get it. And his rookie season was rocky. No offense to Sylvester Stallone, to say the least. According to PFF, he allowed eight sacks and committed 12 penalties and finished with a grade of 60.1, which shows that there's plenty of room for improvement. But he is still young, and he does have the traits of an elite offensive lineman. However, going just off of his rookie season, I'm going to have to give him a grade of D. Seventh overall pick, Tyree Wilson. 
Wilson, Las Vegas Raiders. Despite playing in all 17 of the Raiders games, Wilson did not record a start. He also played under half of their defensive snaps, recorded three and a half sacks, and had one fumble recovery. His PFF grade was a very disappointing 47.1, but how much of that was on the coaching staff and not giving him enough chances? Who knows? You would like to think that a guy with his physical traits next to Max Crosby would eventually develop into a very, very good player. Time will tell, but as a rookie, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give him a very low grade of D. Eighth overall pick, Bajan Robinson, Atlanta Falcons. This is kind of like the Saquon Barkley 2.0 debate. When the Giants drafted Barkley second overall in 2018, everyone agreed this is a great football player, but it's almost like the equivalent of having a nice, beautiful HD TV in your house and that house is burning down. Guess what? It's great at what it does, but it doesn't really help you. And that's kind of what we have here with Robinson. He did stuff the stat sheet. He finished with almost 1,500 yards of total offense and eight touchdowns. The guy can play football. That's not the issue here. But the Falcons didn't really need him. They already had a 1,000 yard rusher. And guess what? The Falcons finished with the same record for the third straight year, seven and 10. Arthur Smith got fired and Atlanta still needs a quarterback. Robinson, the player, I would say is very good and could become an all pro someday. But as for the actual draft pick, I'm gonna have to give it a grade of C. Ninth overall pick, Jalen Carter, Philadelphia. Everybody knows the fact that just based off of talent and film, Carter probably should have been the first overall pick last season. But because of quote unquote off field issues, aka he was involved in some street racing deaths, reckless driving, some pretty serious stuff. He fell to the ninth pick and he showed why he should have been the first overall pick. He was dominant when he played. He had six sacks and two forced fumbles while in a more rotational role and he had an elite 89 PFF grade. As an Eagles fan though, this only makes me more angry because we were still fucking dog shit on defense despite adding a great defensive player. Now that Fletcher Cox is probably going to be gone for agency or retired as well as maybe Brandon Graham, he should be getting more snaps and his stats should explode. Grade A+. plus. Tenth overall pick, Darnell Wright, Chicago Bears. Another offensive lineman, so I'm going to go to the experts who watch the every down plays here. The tape on Wright is that he is a serviceable run blocker but had plenty of struggles in pass protection, allowing seven sacks and 11 penalties. But for a rookie offensive lineman in the NFL, that's not really that shocking. If Wright is still having the same struggles by midpoint of next season, then I think it's time to start worrying. For now, I'll say he has a C minus grade. 11th overall pick, Peter Skaronski. Again, another offensive lineman. I'm going to defer to PFF. I don't sit here and pretend and bullshit you guys like I'm sitting around watching film and all these offensive linemen. Skaronski was the top offensive tackle in his class last year, so getting him at 11th overall was a haul, or at least a lot of people felt like it. The Titans eventually moved him to guard. Shout out to Robert Gallery. Raiders fans will get that reference. Where he allowed five sacks and was not very good in the run blocking department. A lot of improvement to make. So just like Darnell right before him, I'm going to give him a grade of C minus. 12th overall pick, Jameer Gibbs. We finally get to another skill position player. It didn't take a draft expert to know that the Lions were widely panned at the time for taking Jameer Gibbs. And this might come off as a bit hypocritical because I just took a giant shit all over the Falcons for drafting Bajan Robinson when they didn't need a running back. And here we have the Lions taking Gibbs despite having David Montgomery. But Gibbs was so good. He finished with just under a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns. And he was a big reason why the Lions had the fifth best offense in the league and won their first division title in 30 years and were a handful of plays away from going to the freaking Super Bowl. And because of that, I'm gonna have to give this a grade of A. The only reason it's not an A plus is because of positional value. 13th overall pick, Lucas Van Ness, Green Bay. Packers took another pass rusher last year when they already had a lot of depth there. You can never have too many pass rushers, but he really only had a solid rookie season. Nothing special. Four sacks, but he could get better. But as of right now, the pick is nothing to write home about. So I'll give it an average grade of C. 14th overall pick, Roderick Jones, Pittsburgh. Unlike some of the other offensive linemen that I've gone through who had their rookie struggles, Jones was actually pretty good, according to the experts. He allowed four sacks, which is a little bit high, but he only committed two penalties, which is pretty rare for a rookie lineman. He also helped make Najee Harris look good, which is extremely impressive. And for that, I'm going to give him a grade of B+. 15th overall pick, Will McDonald the fourth New York Jets. The Jets could have used another offensive lineman, but they decided to increase their strength with a strength by going after an edge rusher. And that deciding to pick a non-offensive lineman with their first round pick didn't look very good almost immediately when their franchise quarterback Aaron Rodgers snapped his Achilles in half on a rushed play. McDonald didn't even play a fifth of the Jets defensive snaps in 15 games and finished with three sacks. But I will say one thing, his pass rush win rate was very, very good, which begs the question, why wasn't he getting more of an opportunity? 
see. Maybe he'll get that next year. While I don't think this was a great pick per se, I do think McDonald still has potential and could be a good player. So I'm going to give this a C minus grade, but I'm going to say that he is a sleeper. Remember this. 16th overall pick, Emmanuel Forbes, Washington. To say that it was a forgettable rookie year for the Washington cornerback would be very nice. He was benched twice early on and was repeatedly picked apart like barbecue chicken. According to Pro Football Reference, quarterbacks had a 105.3 passer rating when throwing at him, basically meaning that if you threw at this guy, you turned into Patrick Mahomes. He gave up three touchdowns. He was known for interceptions in college, but he had just one in his first year as a pro. Yeah, basically a failure on all fronts. Grade D. 17th overall pick, Christian Gonzalez, New England. Much like with Anthony Richardson, Gonzalez was showing incredibly impressive flashes before he suffered a season-ending injury early on. A torn labrum that ended his season after just four games, but he was one of the few bright spots on Bill Belichick's final miserable New England Patriots team. At the time of his injury, PFF had him graded at 80.8, which is very, very good. He has everything that you need to be the next shutdown corner in New England after guys like Stephon Gilmore, even going back to Ty Law, Darrell Rivas, you name it. But because he only played in four games, I'm gonna have to say he has an incomplete grade. 18th overall pick, Jack Campbell, Detroit. This pick was highly criticized, and for about five minutes, I thought that Dan Campbell drafted his son, which would not have surprised me at all. But Campbell and Jack Campbell are not related, and in his rookie season, Jack Campbell had two sacks and 95 combined tackles. He had an amazing run defense grade from PFF and was a, a reason why Detroit finished as the number two run defense behind only the Bears. Now, how relevant and important that is in today's NFL is up for debate, but still, it's always better to be good at something defensively than bad. And because of that, I'm going to give Campbell a B minus grade. 19th overall pick, Elijah Cansey, Tampa Bay. A defensive tackle, four sacks, seems pretty good on the surface, but this is where deep diving on data and film study comes into play. Depending on how much impact and emphasis you put on PFF, they gave him a woeful 46.6 grade. He was supposed to make Tampa's stout run defense even better, but he was graded with a miserable 29.8 out of 100 in run defense. He was supposed to be Vita Vea's buddy in wrecking havoc, but just didn't turn out that way. Because of that, I'm gonna have to give him a grade of D. 20th overall pick, Jackson Smith and Jigba. For a team that underachieved last year, the Seahawks did pretty well in the first round with Devon Weatherspoon and Njigba, who hauled in 63 catches for 628 yards and four scores. He also had a game-winning touchdown in the last minute against my Eagles on Monday Night Football, which I'm not mad about at all. Stop saying I'm mad about it. You'd like to see the yards per completion go up a little bit, but that's only a matter of time. And also, he's basically a third receiver behind DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, but there is potential here. So I'm going to give this a grade of B. 21st overall pick, Quinton Johnson, Los Angeles Chargers. Poor Quinton. Simply put, when you look at Quinton compared to the guys drafted immediately after him at his position, he was a massive disappointment and already looks like a major draft bust. It wasn't due to lack of opportunity. Mike Williams missed most of the year. Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler missed considerable time. Johnson still failed to step up with Justin Herbert and company. He had 38 receptions for 431 yards and two touchdowns. Five times he suited up and had 10 yards or fewer. Yeah. He also had some big drops and was a big reason why the Chargers were so pitiful. But maybe Jim Harbaugh will be able to get the most out of him and give him a second chance. But for now, though, I am forced to give him a grade of F, sadly. 22nd overall pick, Zay Flowers, Baltimore. Is it a coincidence that the Ravens drafted a true legitimate number one receiver for Lamar Jackson and Jackson went on to win his second MVP, albeit a very weak MVP historically? Flowers had 77 catches for 858 yards and five touchdowns, and he needed to with Mark Andrews missing seven games. But as it seems like with almost every Ravens superstar player, there are some off-field issues as he was accused of domestic violence after the season and is currently being investigated for it, following in the footsteps of Ray Rice and Ray Lewis. If he turns out to be guilty of that, then I think people will be a lot less forgiving of him fumbling the ball out of the end zone in the AFC Championship game. But for now, strictly on the field, he gets a grade of A. 23rd overall pick, Jordan Addison, Minnesota. Yet another receiver the Chargers could have had that ended up being leaps and bounds better than Quinton Johnson. Of course, we all know that any receiver going into Minnesota now is going to be 
be the number two option. No offense to Odell Beckham behind Justin Jefferson. And Addison was perfect in that role. He had 70 catches for 911 yards, never forget, and 10 receiving touchdowns tied for the most among all rookies. There's no doubt about it. The Vikings have an elite receiving trio if they can stay healthy with Jefferson, Addison, and TJ Hawkinson. It always seems like that, though. It always seems like the Vikings have elite receivers, and yet they always end up winning nothing. Still, Addison gets a grade of A for his great rookie season, and he also doesn't have any domestic violence investigations going on. 24th overall pick, Deontay Banks, New York Giants. Banks was the perfect example of baptism by fire as a rookie on a terrible Giants team. He gave up 606 yards in coverage and four touchdowns, but he also allowed just 55.2% completions, and opposing quarterbacks had a 79.6 passer rating when targeting him, which isn't that great. As of now, to me, the future is kind of up in the air with him, but he did show flashes, but none of this matters as long as the Giants continue to trot out dog crap at quarterback, but that's just for another video. Anyway, as for Deontay Banks, I'm going to split the difference and give him a C for a grade. 25th overall pick, Dalton Kincaid, Buffalo. The Bills didn't have enough white tight ends. Much like Andy did to Woody at the beginning of Toy Story, Josh Allen looked at Dawson Knox and said, I'm done playing with you, at least for a little while, and got Kincaid involved. Kincaid finished the season with 73 passes for 673 yards and two touchdowns. I want to get that yards per catch up over 10. Be a man. Come on. I still think Dawson Knox is the better tight end at the moment, but Kincaid showed enough flashes of potential to justify the pick. I'm going to give him a grade of B-. 26th overall pick, Mazzy Smith, Dallas. The Dallas front seven was already loaded when they made this pick, but Smith underwhelmed anyway, having just one sack and three quarterback pressures in a limited role, shuffling in and out on defense. He was a terrible run defender, having a miserable 34.9 run defense grade, which proved to be one of Dallas's few weaknesses defensively until the playoffs, that is, where they lost again before the NFC Championship game for the 27th straight year. Anyway, back to Smith. I'm going to give him a grade of an F. 27th overall pick, Anton Harrison, another offensive lineman. Harrison committed seven penalties and allowed five sacks, but there were stretches where he did show flashes of being a potential pro bowler. Like with a lot of other fellow rookie offensive linemen, very rarely do they come in and just straight up dominate. There's going to be ups and downs, and Harrison is no exception to this. I'll give him a grade of C-. 28th overall pick, Miles Murphy, Cincinnati. In a disappointing season for the Bengals, it was an unquestionably disappointing season for their first round pick. He played only 28% of their defensive snaps and had three sacks in those. But this kind of gets back to the chicken and the egg argument. Are the coaches not playing this guy more because he sucks or is it the coach's fault that he's not playing more and therefore it's the coaches who are responsible for the lackluster numbers? I guess we're just going to have to wait and see this year as we get a larger sample size. 29th overall pick, Brian Bressy. As a rotational player, Bressy had six passes defended and four and a half sacks but in run defense, he was straight up dog shit. As PFF ranked him at 45.5. Considering how bad the Saints run defense was, they needed him to be a lot better than he was. And because of that, I'm going to give him a grade of C minus. But like with all rookies, he's still young and has time to improve. So he's not a failure yet. 30th overall pick, Nolan Smith, Philadelphia. As an Eagles fan, I was pretty excited when Smith got drafted, even though I was a little bit concerned that we were drafting too many Georgia Bulldogs. Smith ended up staying healthy for all 17 games, largely because he only played 188 snaps, spending most of the year on special teams. He had one sack and his PFF grade was a very lackluster 50.2. His struggles also played a role in the Eagles defense being massively disappointing. However, I am not giving up yet as he should get much more opportunity now that Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox are either going to move on to free agency or retire. If he still struggles this year, then time to move on from him. Grade F. And finally, the 31st overall pick, Felix Anudik Uzama. Yeah, I said it correctly. What are you going to do about it? Suck my dick. Uzama might have had a Super Bowl ring but it was kind of a Darko Milicic ring from the 04 Pistons. Despite the Chiefs' incredible defense this year, it had very little to do with their first round pick. He had just half a sack, no offense to Lance Armstrong in 17 games, and only played on one-fifth of KC's defensive snaps. You never want to criticize a team that just won the Super Bowl, but they really could have used a receiver here instead. But who am I kidding? As long as they got Patrick Mahomes, it doesn't really matter if they miss on draft picks. That's how good Mahomes is. Anyway, Uzama grade F.